Activist and advocate Kena Collins is taking on veteran lawmaker Danny Davis in Illinois. This week, Collins officially announced her challenge with plans to pursue an agenda focused on gun safety, racial justice, and health care. Collins has received backing from the Justice Democrats. She joins us now to discuss her campaign. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, you got it. So you, you took on uh, Danny Davis uh, last time around. Have you noticed a, a difference in, in the rollout this week compared to how you rolled out your campaign, I guess, two years ago now? Such a good question. Um, absolutely. I think that really what we made clear with my rollout yesterday was that we're uniting Democrats on the national level and on the local level. Um, we got a flurry of uh, in the ground, I mean, on the ground in district support from progressive groups that did help uh, Congress people like Marie Newman win um, in her primary and folks are just fired up um, and it helps to have that national support too. Now, Chicago is a city riddled, unfortunately, with violence and tragedy. It's a beautiful, beautiful city, a beautiful district that you're running in. Can you tell us about how the how you are playing a part in the sort of evolution here of the left's message when it comes to gun violence? As a that's a, a big part of your agenda and your campaign. So after a year of sort of the left saying defund the police and then maybe saying, well, maybe the black community isn't is as in favor of that as some white progressives on the national stage might be. What's your position going forward as you're running this campaign and you're talking to voters? What should the message be? Yeah, so I live in the Austin neighborhood, the South Austin neighborhood, which is um, one of the deadliest neighborhoods in the city of Chicago on the west side. And that's my ground zero. You know, this is where I grew up. My story started when I witnessed a child in my community gunned down. I knew that child and I knew the shooter too. And it changed the absolute trajectory of my life. Um, the messaging is that as a public health advocate and somebody who's been in the gun violence prevention space, we've been talking about public uh, scaling public health models for decades. We've been saying that our money should be reallocated towards wraparound services, trauma-informed care, and violence interruption programs. My impetus for running is to say that um, people in Washington, D.C. and nationally have used Chicago as a political punching bag when we talk about gun violence. Well, if you're going to talk about gun violence, then you need to talk about the failed leadership and the failed public policy that has not come in to help people. When we shut down public schools, when there's lead in the water um, and when there's police officers gunning us down in the streets as well, that is not helping us solve the problem of eradicating gun violence. I want to ask you about your your kind of perception of the role uh, role of a member of Congress. You know that the House uh, that recently vote, passed right? uh, by one vote, uh, one point nine uh, trillion dollar uh, package, uh, one point nine billion dollar package. I'm sorry, uh, toward mm -hmm. the the Capitol Police in the wake of the the January sixth. A lot of money to the Capitol Police. A lot of money for upgrades to uh, building security. A lot of, a lot of money to the National Guard. The, the, the squad, which you would be seeking to join, kind of split on that with three members voting present, three voting no. The ones who voted present kind of enabled it, it to pass. If, if you were in the House then, you know, how would you have voted on that measure? Yeah, I would have voted no on the legislation, and here's why. In the city of Chicago, nearly 40 to 50 percent of our city budget has gone towards the Chicago Police Department. Um, beyond that, almost $1 billion uh, is being paid by taxpayers and settlements for wrongful death lawsuits, for torture tactics that have been used against civilians, for basically them not doing their jobs. Um, if we want to fix and really solve some of the most pressing and urgent issues in urban centers across this country, um, it's not going to be us just pouring all of these resources into police. We need to make sure that we're striking at the systemic issues and causes of gun violence, housing inequity, health care inequity, um, in order to solve these problems. So it would have been a, a no for me. You know, that gets to a really interesting conundrum. Ryan just mentioned how the squad was split on that particular vote. And going forward, looking at what votes might look like on this massive infrastructure package, um, there has been a mentality of sort of going along to get along with the squad, very different than how the Freedom Caucus, let's say, operated in the, the post-Tea Party years. 
What would your approach to that be? I mean, if you have a take it or leave it infrastructure bill, um, you know, just generally, hypothetically, that is larded up with gifts to special interests, it doesn't have all the progressive priorities included. Would you, you know, as a as a congresswoman, approach that as sort of like, hey, we got some of the stuff we needed. It's a baby step, but it's a step. Or hey, these people did not listen to progressives. The establishment took over this bill. I'm a no on it. How would you sort of strike that balance? You know, um, we I live in a district that's a D plus 38. We are the deepest, darkest blue district in all of the state of Illinois. They want someone who is going to represent them. And so these are, of course, conversations that you have with constituents and voters in the district. But one of the biggest issues that we have in the Democratic Party um, is folks just voting with status quo and what has worked in, along party leadership lines. Um, I think the people in my district want me to represent them. And if it is something that is detrimental to our district, then yes, I'm going to vote no on that. Um, it's the reason why we're not taking any corporation money. It's the reason why we're not taking big pharma and big private private insurance money, which is the hugest difference between me and the incumbent. It's because people want an a, a elected official to represent them that's unbought and unbossed. And that is and that's who I'm going to be once I'm elected. As, as somebody who's kind of looking to looking to join the squad in Congress, what's your analysis so far? Of, of their strategy in Congress and, and, and how well they've done. Where, where do you think they've done well? Where do you think they've fallen short? Well, you know, I think that they've shifted the paradigm of what leadership looks like and the non-traditional candidate who could, um, you know, run for office and represent their district. I think that they've also uh, bucked against the status quo and have questioned leadership and are, you know, asking them to act really answer really hard questions that people all across this country and namely and particularly working class families want answered. You know, when I had to leave school because I couldn't pay for my tuition, it wasn't lost on me that the people who are making these laws are folks who are millionaires and billionaires and who don't understand that that pain of what that feels like. And so I think that, you know, them breaking the monotony of what a traditional candidate or elected official should look like or the background that they should come from has really informed their policy and has made other people feel emboldened to represent their districts as well. Now, you're running against an incumbent, and I think in some ways that's an advantage, in some ways it's a disadvantage. I'm curious specifically on the issue of institutional trust, how that's playing out as you're talking to voters and you're considering what people want to hear, what people should hear, because I think so many disenfranchised communities in this country um, are mired in an institutional crust trust crisis. They have been failed by Washington. People in your community have been failed by Washington. They've been failed in le by leaders of their own state time and again. So as you're out on the campaign trail, how what level of institutional distrust exists? I mean, is it as bad as, a, as it seems from the outside? Is it that people reasonably don't trust anyone in positions of power? But how does that translate onto the ground from what into what you're hearing from voters? People want to know who's been there. You know, the arc of the story of the progressive space in the city of Chicago has been a really interest, interesting one in the last six years. I was on the front lines when Laquan McDonald's tape was released to the city of Chicago. And that institutional trust that had that basically upheld the Chicago machine for years cratered overnight. It's the reason why we ran Rahm Emanuel out of the city of Chicago. <laughs> People are tired of folks who have sat in these seats decade after decade, and they, they're they saying, we are the experts of our communities. We don't need someone to tell us that we want to build strong public schools, fortify our local economy to hire people, protect our small businesses. And yes, you shouldn't take big pharma and private insurance money because we should have equity when we're talking about uh, health care and getting access to health care. And so really the voters in my district, they want to know, you know, are you qualified uh, for the job and have you been in these frontline fights? And for me, I'm a survivor. I'm a public policy expert. But most importantly, I am a leader and I'm a problem solver. And that's why I think we're going to attract way more voters this time. So the highest profile legislation that uh, Congress has passed so far under the Biden era was the was the covid re relief package. 
progressive Democrats were criticized for not stalling, not holding that up in order mm -hmm. to make sure that the $15 minimum wage was in there. If, if you were in Congress, what would you have, uh, how would you have voted and what would you have been uh, advising your colleagues to do? You know, I think that you, you do have to speak to the constituents um, in, in your district and in your area. Um, for me, there are some very hard lines, you know, that would force me to vote no on certain pieces of legislation. Um, I think the concern and the fear was people needing the urgency to get access to the money that they needed at that time. But there were a lot of things uh, in the legislation that just were not helpful for working class families. And so um, I think we do need to be strong in the progressive space. We do need to be united um, and we need to draw those boundaries and those hard lines. So, you know, for, for me, uh, people in our district, they think that the $15 minimum wage is the floor, not the ceiling. So I think that they would want me to fight hard um, to make sure that that's included and to push back when it's not. So when Justice Democrats get in early in a race like this, it really puts it on the kind of uh, nas national radar. What, what argument did you make to, to Justice Democrats that despite your last campaign, Danny Davis really is beatable this time? Well, what we've seen is that his uh, voting has, the percentage of people who are coming out to vote for him is chipping away. Um, we, the challengers who were in the race last time, we got him down nearly to 60%. So we know that if a strong candidate emerged who could unite uh, Democrats in the district and, and specifically the progressive space, that that would be a, a really hard challenge uh, for the congressman. And so, uh, number one, you know, um, I'm homegrown talent in the Illinois 7th. I lived in this district my entire life. Um, people know me. Um, I think Justice Democrats thought they just needed to help me build out an infrastructure. And then we build off of that grassroots support um, that we have in the district. I raised the least amount of money out of all of the candidates and came in second. Um, and so really with almost no money. So really we did have people power, people power on the ground and now we're trying to expand that. Well, Keena Collins will be watching the race closely. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And more rising coming up next.